Welcome back, perfect peeps, to another perfect.dev. It's a uh, cold day here in Michigan, but Brian Lee from Kinsta is joining me. I hope it's a little warmer where you're at. I don't know. It's also pretty cold. Well, I think our definition of cold is probably different. So how cold is it actually there? In Fahrenheit, it's 41-ish. Okay. It's, I think it's, it's maybe cold. 50s here. So okay. It's around the same. Nice. A little warmer. Yeah. That's awesome. So as I said, Brian is from Kinsta. Um, he is the website content manager at Kinsta, which is pretty sweet. Uh, Kinsta is a managed WordPress hosting provider that helps take care of all your needs regarding your website. And they run their services on cutting edge technology and take support seriously. That is a, a good statement because we're going to talk about how I went back to Kinsta. Let's do it. Sweet. So I'm going to pop open first of all. Brian's got his sweet blog that he's he's got up over here. So I just want to show everybody if you're interested in things like core web vitals, which everyone should be. I know I am. You should go check out his website for sure. Um, we're both kind of passionate about web, so you'll see a lot of crossover on, on his stuff. Yeah. I love it. Cool. Yeah, so just let's... a mix of web stuff and photography and music stuff. Just very random, whatever I feel like writing about. Yeah, I learned uh, you're a sound engineer, so I got to believe there's yeah. a little bit of flair in there from the sound yeah. side of things. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to bring up a little post that I did. Um, for your, for those of you on the, the podcast, I'm just showing my my screen up on codingcat.dev. Um, I just posted about kind of our journey with with Kinsta, um, and I break down why why we made this uh, switch. So we started out on Kinsta. I was pretty impressed, but I thought you know we're gonna grow and I'm gonna have to host um, some more sites. So I'm gonna go shop around. And I actually ended up moving um, our entire site twice from WordPress engine because I've always had a, a Gemini uh, theme. So I figured we could kind of tie back into that. And then uh, found out that wasn't gonna work great. So we went to Flywheel. Flywheel and I were talking quite a bit what I did not like and um, ended up ultimately kind of dropping out of Flywheel was because even on their like lowest plan, they didn't yeah. disclose what they were doing with the system. So I was getting all kinds of errors and all of a sudden I'm like, what is, what is happening? Like, why is this occurring? And they're like, Oh, you're on the, the very basic plan. So we turn everything down and I'm like, Whoa, that's, that's <laughs> not okay. Like you didn't yeah. tell me you were doing any of this stuff. I was trying to check out your, your services um, to get a good idea of, of what was going on. Um, and so to that regard, <laughs> I kind of said, okay, enough's enough. Um, even though uh, I think they they all have kind of their own uniqueness, I'm going to jump over to AWS. Like I can just do this on my own. Um, and so <laughs> here's the last words. <laughs> <laughs> so I, in, in, in my defense, I do all serverless uh, kind of Jamstack based sites and yeah. we do IoT stuff at my day job. And I, I definitely know what I'm doing, but when it came to standing up a WordPress site, you'll see for those on the video side that can already see it. Let me let me see if I can make it a little bigger. Um, it's kind of a crazy, crazy system that you have to set yeah. up on AWS. Um, luckily, I found a, a neat little dev.2 post um, on how to do it. The cloud formation was all built out. So I gave it a go. And it was rough. CloudFormation was failing like CloudFormation loves to do. And I was done. I'm like, I'm not fighting anymore. We're going back to Kinsta. So then I reached out to Brian and said, hey, do you want to come on the podcast? I love Google Cloud Platform. I'm a Firebase GDE. Let's talk more about Kinsta. So yeah. that's why Brian's joining us today. Here we go. Um, so to dive in, my, my first question that I have here, if I click the right banner, there we go. So what's the difference between shared hosting, VPS, or dedicated hosting? Yeah. 
Yeah. So the difference between shared hosting, VPS, and dedicated, there's, you know, that's such a, a loaded question. And there's, me there's many things that, that we can discuss. But I think uh, for the purpose of this podcast, uh, what we're leaning towards is maybe the performance side of things and also the security side of things. Because uh, WordPress is, is kind of notoriously popular for hackers to, to try to hack. So yeah. uh, the security aspect is actually very important when it comes to WordPress. But when we're talking about shared VPS and dedicated, if you asked me which one is best, I really couldn't give you an answer because it really depends on the use case. Sure. Uh, you know, some people only have five bucks a month to spend. Some <laughs> people have more to spend. Uh, and based on how much you want to spend, based on the importance of your site, is it just a hobby? Is it like your business? Uh, what you use to put food on the table? It's very different. But uh, the whole premise of shared hosting is kind of uh, all of the sites live on a single server. And in most cases, there's not really uh, a layer that's separating those sites. So in many cases, what ends up happening is if, uh, let's say some code gets uh, injected into one site, that could potentially affect uh, another site that's on the same server. And that's because uh, there's no really any system uh, that's separating those sites. And if you move up to VPS and dedicated, uh, let's talk about dedicated first. And I feel like sure. uh, in in the current environment that we're in, I feel like I, I don't have any like specific numbers about this, but just from a gut instinct, I feel that the dedicated server kind of thing is kind of phasing out as compared to 10 years ago. And that's because you have these things like GCP, AWS, and all of these platforms that essentially give you unlimited scale. Of course, it's not really unlimited but for most people. You know, you can scale up to 96, 128 cores and terabytes of RAM, you know. That sounds if your fantastic. WordPress site needs that much RAM, uh, <laughs> you're doing something wrong. Uh, so I think the dedicated and is basically like you have your own box and it sits in a data center somewhere. And I think there's still a use case for certain like enterprise kind of use cases where top security is needed and you need complete control over the whole stack. Uh, but for consumer and for mainstream sites, I feel like uh, people are re relying on that kind of serverless. Uh, and so moving on to the VPS, that's kind of looking at an isolated slice of a dedicated server or of a larger entity, like something like cloud. Uh, so you basically have a slice of cores, you have a slice of RAM, you have a slice of storage, and you can treat it like your own computer. Uh, so I see cloud computing as kind of a VPS, but a lot more scale. Uh, and that's definitely the direction that uh, I feel like WordPress hosting is moving towards. All of the major WordPress hosts are moving towards platforms uh, that use VPS or VPS-ish kind of things. You know, at Kinsta, we migrated over to GCP. Uh, some hosts are using AWS, and I'm sure there's a bunch of people uh, on Cloudways that are using maybe... DigitalOcean, Linode, and Vulture, you know, these are kind of not lower end, but, you know, kind of like the mid-tier of uh, the VPS side. So, yeah, and, and some, yeah. something I should have clarified kind of in the beginning of that. So virtual private server is kind of what we're yeah. describing when we say VPS. Yeah. And the way that we use VPS is is also different from other hosts, I think. Like the thing with VPS, it's basically uh, you have all of the resources that you could use to make a server. So even if you have a VPS, you could still have some kind of basic shared hosting. Uh, so that's one thing that I want to differentiate. Uh, that's not the route that we go down. You know, uh, we instead use LXC, uh, which stands for 
Linux containers. And there's a lot to talk about that, but uh, basically it's just uh, a container environment that's kind of an overlay on top of uh, the operating system. And it allows you to, it, uh, it allows us to make a container for each site. So what that means is each site is in a completely sandboxed environment. So if there's some bad code on one of your sites, it's not going to jump over to um, one of your second or third sites. So that's, that's really a big plus. Uh, and that's uh, one of the main reasons that I think uh, why Kinsta hosting is so secure. Yeah, it's it's super cool. So for those who who are just on the podcast listening, um, I, I brought up a graph, and Brian can probably talk to it a little bit. Um, it's got the the user and the internet on the the left side, and then um, so that traffic's coming in through a, a Google Cloud firewall, um, a Nginx load balancer, and then it's got something that I'm not fully familiar with is the LXD host, which you can talk through maybe a little bit if that's Kubernetes or what that is. And then the LXC containers, if you have kind of that multi-site or multi-server, I should say, yeah. uh, set up in there. Yeah. Uh, so I guess I can just walk through the, the hosting stack a bit. So uh, when a request first enters our infrastructure, we do use the premium tier network uh, of Google Cloud, which is different from um, I guess the public network that actually most hosts use, uh, even if they use GCP, they're not on the premium tier because it does cost more. And then the benefits of the premium tier is, uh, it's more on like more of the traffic goes through Google's private, um, connections like around the world. And, you know, that just, that's just like a way that we can help speed up sites more. And uh, if you, I think there's some benchmarks in one of our, our posts, I believe the premium tier resulted in maybe like a 20% uh, decrease in TTFB. Uh, that's time to first bite. Yeah. And then after that, you know, it hits the, the firewall and then load balancer. That's not really anything too special. You know, a lot of hosts have the firewall, I, I hope. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. uh, also maybe load balancing of some kind. And the LXD host, uh, you know, I'm not on the sysadmin side, so I can't really get into too many of the specifics, but I think that's just like a way to manage uh, all of the containers that you have. And um, those containers are called LXC. Uh, C is for container. And basically each container uh, has its own instance of the database, has its own instance of Nginx and also PHP. Uh, so none of those are like global, you know, you're not going to use the Nginx instance from like someone else's site. You know, each container has its own um, built-in stack uh, when we're talking about the database, the web server and PHP. So it just allows for your site to run in, run in its own isolated environment. So do you think that's for security, speed, reliability, or it's just kind of the whole picture? Yeah, I think the two main things are security and reliability. Uh, and, and that's just because it is in an isolated environment. So, um, you know, there's not going to be any code execution from a from a hacked site. Uh, so it's secure and more reliable because of that. And I think the speed part of it is more just like the general infrastructure that we use as well as our hosting stack uh, is very well tuned. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's pretty impressive. The, the one thing that stands out for me in that um, kind of in that diagram, I, I'm not used to Maria I think it's Maria DB. Um, yeah. Can you talk a minute about the choice there, or maybe maybe you don't know um, as far as going with Maria. Yeah. So I don't know the complete history, but I think the general kind of gist is that 
at some point, MySQL was uh, acquired by Oracle, maybe. I think it was yeah. Oracle. And then people were kind of unsure about the future, so it was forked. Uh, and then at some point, I don't know if it's MariaDB or MariaDB. I've yeah. heard both, but <laughs> let's just call it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, whatever it is, uh, at some point, it actually performed faster than my SQL. Uh, so during that kind of phase, you saw a lot of people mi migrate over because it was a really quick way to just speed up your site because uh, it didn't really require any additional database formatting because it was more of a drop-in replacement. Uh, so that's kind of the way that we went as well. Uh, I think since that, I think since that time when people were switching over, I think the performance difference has probably narrowed. So now the latest version of my my SQL is probably more uh, in line with what you would expect from um, the fork. So yeah, uh, I I would say I'm I'm not a database expert by any means. Uh, front end guy, hundred percent. You know, yeah. I'll claim to be full stack if if we want to go that far, but. <laughs> um, <laughs> on a good day. Um, but I've always heard that like the, I think it's called my ISIM or my Sam uh, again, yeah. one of those fun names. Um, that's kind of the old school, my SQL setup. And basically you should be running on a, uh, in ODB, which yeah. is kind of where, where that Mariah or Maria comes into play. So I think it's definitely a performant database. Um, yeah. One of the things that I was kind of asking you before we got started um, on, on the talk was, you know, what happens if I was interested in, in getting, you know, better results across the board? Is there an option for me to go with like Cloud SQL um, running on GCP that those containers can then talk to? Right. Yeah, so I I don't <clears throat> think we have any official support for that, but I actually used to work in support in the past uh, when I first joined the team. And there were a few instances where people were using databases that were external uh, to our in infrastructure. Uh, and I cannot recall if there were any specific, uh, you know, roadblocks that they got into. Um, you know, that's not really something that we officially support, but I also don't think it's impossible. So if you have, you know, the, the knowledge or the team to set up um, the managed database over on something like Cloud SQL, I think that that could work. Uh, I can't say for sure because I personally have not tested before, but sure. um, in general, I think the majority of our sites are running fine uh, with our current database setup, but there are certainly like use cases where uh, you might need a really scalable and more managed uh, kind of database from GCP directly. So, you know, if that's something that is interesting to you, maybe uh, that would be something cool to to try out. Maybe yeah. I can try that out as well. Yeah. That would be fun to figure out. Yeah, I, I'm just always curious. Like I work with DynamoDB quite regularly. Um, and just seeing the performance and the guarantees that come out of that. Um, I know it's not technically as transactional as, um, you know, like a, a SQL type of setup. And so I would be curious if you were able to kind of set up your WordPress site to kind of dive out to that, or if, you know, Kinsta has a best suggestion for that. Um, I, I do believe that you said there is some sort of add-on. Is it for search that you can do something? Yeah, so we have two add-ons that can kind of offload the load on the database. So first we have the Redis cache, uh, which yeah, is, yep. you know, it's basically caching the objects or the uh, results of the queries that have run. So for sites especially like e-commerce sites forums uh and maybe even like the learning dashboards that you operate yeah. uh, you might actually see a big improvement <clears throat> uh with the redis add-on that's that's something that i've seen firsthand when i was 
working in support. Uh, often when people were running into a lot of database issues and that's not always like the fault of the host, right? Because if you have a query that's just so bad and like calls so many different things, takes so many different steps, yeah, you know, that's, that's kind of something that's, for lack of a better term, you know, that's something that a dev should probably take a look at because uh, as like we can throw more and more at it, but at some <laughs> point it's not going to scale. Right. Uh, and if it does scale, it's going to cost a fortune when you could just maybe hire someone for a few hundred bucks, like take a look at why the heck uh, this query is like looping where it shouldn't supposed to and all of that stuff. So, but we have found that for those kind of really dynamic sites, if you uh, enable Redis on it, it does help a lot. And the other add-on that we offer is Elasticsearch, uh, which basically if your site uh, gets a lot of uh, search, like you get a lot of people who try to use your search. The native WordPress search is not super performant uh, when it comes to, you know, a large number of people trying to search. So uh, with something like Elasticsearch, it's just maybe... I can say it's a better way to uh, perform those in a more optimized way. Yeah, that that would be pretty sweet. Um, I, I've often thought about kind of using Algolia because I, I use that in all my jam stacks too. So um, yeah. those are two definite options that I'll have to look into. We, we obviously don't have the site traffic yet, but as we bring on more members and those forums start to heat up and things like that, um, I, I feel as though we'll probably get some concerning things back. Um, I'm already, you know, coming from a Jamstack and, and static site generated world. I'm, I'm not loving the performance on WordPress. So I, I'm continuously like looking and figuring out how to tune it um, to the point yeah. where we may end up using WordPress as uh, kind of a headless WordPress and then doing like Next.js on the front. So yeah, yeah. Um, that, that's all kind of in the future, but. So for me, for for a person that doesn't know WordPress that well, obviously I've thrown WordPress sites up over the years, but I just wanted to kind of pop this up real quick. And for those on the podcast, what I'm showing off here is is Kinsta's different plans, and everything I read said that um, you know you should be at least on four PHP workers if you're doing any any type of member site or you know, uh, like a LMS or anything like that. And so I decided to go with this business one plan until we really get cranking. Um, can you talk a minute about, you know, how PHP workers actually um, limit? I mean, we've talked a lot about the database, but is it truly single threaded? Because I'm, I'm used to working like with Node.js where it's, you can thread like crazy. Is that the case here? Yeah, so... How this works is that a PHP worker, you can just think of it as um, a process that is basically listening for incoming requests that require PHP to process. So for those who don't know, like WordPress uh, is powered by PHP. And uh, so that means basically everything that you do within the dashboard, whether it's like trying to save a post that you're writing or uh, maybe performing like a database backup. Uh, a PHP worker has to pretty much like li listen for those kinds of things, and then also um, actually run run the code. And uh, I don't believe a PHP worker, like a single worker, can use more than one CPU at once. Uh, but if you have four of those workers, uh, you know each worker can use a core. Uh, so. In the case of uh, sites like e-commerce sites and forums, so the issue with those sites are that they can't be cached, right? Uh, basically, yeah. once you log into a dashboard, you really don't want to be caching that kind of stuff because that means if someone else accesses that link, then they'll be able to see the page. Uh, that's not something you want. So uh, for those kinds of sites that are more dynamic, P I think the PHP workers is is pretty important. Okay. And and the thing is like 
sometimes people look at these numbers as like, why is there only four? Or like, why is there only two? Without really understanding what they're there for. So Yeah, I'm, I'm one of those people. <laughs> yeah, all right. So when you like have PHP code, and it requires a worker to run just because you have four it doesn't mean it's going to be slow uh because it completely depends on how well the code is written right like sure uh if if your code is making a request to an external uh, site or something and that site takes five seconds to respond then that php worker is going to be occupied for those extra five seconds and that's not at fault of the php worker it's just at fault of either maybe you shouldn't be calling that um, slow thing or perhaps maybe uh, whoever is running that slow thing should probably fix it. So the thing is with like these kinds of things, you see these small numbers and people always love bigger numbers when they're buying things. Like uh, they want more space, they want more cores, they want more RAM and they see like a really small number like four or two or six and they assume that oh this is not worth it but <laughs> but it's really important and uh and it's a big reason why uh we actually switched over to gcp because the faster that your cores are right uh the faster that php code is going to run so if you're on a server that has a CPU running at like, I don't know, two gigahertz versus a server that's running at 3.8. Uh, the faster one, even with the same number of workers, is going to be able to handle more requests per second uh, because it's going to be able to crunch more code uh, in a defined amount of time. So uh, that's, that's kind of why it's important for WordPress uh, to be run on. I would say like high end hardware, just because yep. the faster you can make um, the code run, uh, the faster the whole experience is going to feel. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Um, it's interesting because coming from my background, it's it's been Node.js for so many years. I'm I'm used to like that kind of that event loop and you know asynchronous and uh, coming back to PHP where it seems more single threaded. Um, you don't yeah. get that concurrency piece so right. it's, a, it's a lot for me to kind of start to re-remember since i haven't touched php since college which yes it was 20 years ago folks yeah. um it's it's been a it's been an interesting journey kind of diving back into this side of the house so that was a really awesome kind of overview that you just went through brian appreciate that You're welcome. um one of the things that we we talked about pre-show is the pricing side of it so it seems like um, in one of your blog posts, I'll bring it up here real quick. It lays out the difference um, between AWS and Google on, on pricing. And it seems yeah. like for Kinsta, this was, this was kind of a no brainer in my mind. Um, it looks like Google kind of beat them on everything. Yeah. So when we were initially formed as a company, uh, we were actually, I believe we were on Linode and perhaps a mixture of different hosts. Uh, and then when we were looking at like, what's the next step, you know, we were looking at really the top tier of stuff. So uh, AWS, GCP, I'm not sure if uh, the team looked at Microsoft as well. They might have, but I'm not sure. Uh, but okay. I know that a AWS and GCP were definitely on the list. So I think pricing being the biggest deciding factor, uh, in some ways, like pricing is kind of a major factor for any business uh, where right. uh, you should try to optimize your costs, but you also have to keep the experience in mind. So in this case, I think it worked out both ways because uh, GCP, as you know, I've also used it for some of my own stuff. I don't have any insight into like um, how much we pay uh, for our hosting. You know, I'm not in the f finance side of things, but like yeah, for my I'd own, love to see that yeah. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. I, I mean, I don't want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to pay for it. That's um, right. Yeah, so I think that the 
switch over to Google made sense because a it was and still is cheaper for for things and also uh, maybe we can talk about how we use GCP for our own side gigs as well uh, and also from a hardware perspective you know you you have kind of the same stuff or or better in some cases depending on what kind of things you use uh, than AWS uh, I feel like a lot of a a, a lot of the price kind of difference between GCP and AWS is due to kind of the industry standard kind of vibe that you get with uh, a AWS just because it's been like it's been around for a long time. People really yeah. trust it, and then they can demand a higher price. Um, but you know, in terms of raw performance, uh, at the end of the day, there wasn't a big difference. I think. So, so, you know, I think that was definitely uh, one thing that contributed to why we moved over to GCP. And, you know, I can talk about uh, more of exactly how we use it, but did you want to talk a bit about your experience with the platform as well? Yeah, um, from just the Kinsta standpoint, from my experience and I should have probably previewed this before we jumped on the podcast because I don't know if there's anything sensitive in the dashboard, but um, the dashboard has become like, oops, has become incredible for me. So the fact that Kinsta takes care of like making sure plugins are up to date and then um, the nightly backups um, on my plan at least are, are there and solid. I can do a, a backup whenever I want to, and it's fast. Like, I don't know if there's like snapshotting happening on those um, those LXEs or or how that works, but it's magical. Like uh, another example of you know one of the other providers, not to name names, but um, when I tried to do a backup, it took forever, and they wanted to email me and all this stuff. Um, direct access to the logs. I could I could get into the logs super simple on Kinsta's dashboard. That was another huge plus where others would either email it to me and I had to wait. Um, no access on the SSH level or SFTP. Um, there's just so many limitations and that's what I really yeah. loved and, and liked getting back to. Um, for myself as, as a, a GDE for Firebase, I spend mm -hmm. a lot of time in, in the in that platform. So I yeah. know how amazing it is. And that's not to discount AWS because my day job, that's, that's where I spend a lot of my time too. So I feel as though they're very comparable, but the choices that you guys made very specifically for, for WordPress and how good the hosting is and how you created those containers I think it's a really good story. Um, and I think as people shop around and want good hosting, I, I think you made a great point um, at the beginning. If you if you just want to stand up a, a five page static WordPress site, like yeah. don't spend a hundred dollars a month. I'm, I'm right. telling you right now, like that's crazy. Um, but if you're doing like real business of any kind, uh, I would suggest Kinsta. I mean, I, I I wasted probably two three weeks on trying to decide on on where to host and yeah, like a, like I put in my blog post, we came right back to it. So, um, yeah. I think I think if you would have asked probably a year or two years ago, I'm not sure when you guys made the change, but there was a lot of hesitation. And now I think if you Google anything, people are like Kinsta's up their game, and you know they're on a trajectory to really take over the market. So. It's very impressive. Yeah, so I think <clears throat> one, one one last thing I kind of wanted to touch on on this topic. We were kind of talking before where uh, if we were in a situation where we were able to reduce our costs, like our, our yeah. is the savings in cost pass on to the customer. So uh, that's that's actually a really interesting question, and. This is like me speaking from my own mind. It's not necessarily from the viewpoint of Kinsta, but I think that uh, one of the most important things, is, especially for a managed WordPress host, is to build features into the dashboard, into the overall experience that 
can kind of uh, save the customer time slash capital uh, kind of in a secondary way. So it's not like, oh, we're going to reduce the cost of our plan from 100 bucks a month to 90 bucks a month. So that's not really what I'm talking about. Like uh, the backup thing is a great example. So you were talking about how on a different host, uh, the backup was taking so long. And <laughs> yeah, and that's a problem because maybe that host didn't exactly think about the user experience where the first question is like, why would someone be making a backup, right? And one of the, I guess, most common situations where someone would be making a backup is like, oh crap, I need to make a backup right now uh, so I can restore to a site because my site just crashed or something. So yeah. uh, the faster that you can make that process, uh, you know, that in turn, you know, can have that customer, you know, you save their time. And if they're, and if they rely on their site to make sales and every minute gone is X number of sales gone, yep. then that's like a real impact. So I think when we're talking about cost savings, people think Kinsta is very expensive. Uh, our plans start at 30 bucks a month, which is like a dollar a day, which is almost five or six times what you would pay for a shared host. But yeah. on the op and but on the opposite side of that, uh, we are constantly like since I've been at Kinsta for almost two years now, you know, we're constantly working on new features uh, yeah. that can save you time, uh, can save you money. And we're actually on the verge of launching another new feature that is pretty huge and no one else is doing it. But uh, I can't Just talk about it, that. Just tell us. Soon. <laughs> Just drop it. Come on. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's kind of the point that I wanted to make. Like people often think that Kinsta is expensive without factoring in the, uh, you know, the time that a managed platform like this can save and time is money. And so I would say instead of passing savings along to the customer in absolute dollar value, we're constantly making the service more valuable um, so you can use your time better. Yeah. Hundred percent, that makes sense. And and like I said, it it might not be for you know my son's kind of WordPress that he never messes with. Like I, I think yeah. for a legit customer, even at the thirty dollar range, you're getting a lot of value back out of it. So, yeah. I mean, I'm not here to like you know push kins down anybody. Um, it's just my experience and kind of what we've gone through, and that's why I was excited to be able to, to talk to you about the GCP yeah. underlying piece too. So um, probably coming up on time, people are, are probably getting tired of listening to us, but we'll definitely uh, have to <laughs> sync back up and get together. We, yeah. we do always do at the, the end of the show, um, a couple perfect picks is what we call them, perfect picks. I always got to say perfect peeps. Meow, perfect meow, meow. Peeps. There you go. You got it. Um, so, so Brian, what is your pick if you're ready? I don't want to put you on the spot too much. Yeah. So one thing that I've been digging into a lot lately is Cloudflare Workers. Uh, so it's basically edge computing platform comparable uh, to Lambda. If you're on AWS, if you're on GCP, there's... Google Cloud, Cloud Functions. Functions. Yeah. yeah. And I really like Cloudflare Workers, especially recently. You know, they've added support for Python, Rust, uh, a few other languages. So, you know, I'm not really big on JavaScript. That's not because I hate it or something. It's just I've never really dug into it so much. Uh, so now that they have all of these different kinds of languages, it's pretty cool. And uh, one of the best things I like about it is there's no cold starts, which is okay. incredible. Uh, so yeah, there. So you see their support for zero millisecond cold starts. Uh, so this is this is very similar to a lot of the stuff that was released, I think, last year at at reInvent for AWS um, at the edge. Yeah, cool. I think that Cloud Functions. I'm not sure if AWS has. Uh, no cold starts on all tiers, but um, the fact that you can just like do this kind of stuff with no cold starts and not have to pay like five bucks a month or 10 bucks a month or whatever, you know, you just um, 
just That's pay for cool. what you use is pretty cool. So I've actually moved my personal site over to be hosted on Cloudflare Workers. And cool. it's just super fast from all around the world. Cool. Yeah. And what's what's your personal site like build on? Uh, I think we talked a minute about it. Oh yeah. So it's uh built with Hugo. Uh it's generated with Hugo. Maybe not built with Hugo. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's generated with Hugo and uh, it's basically just built with all of my own hacked together coding, uh, some HTML, CSS, some JavaScript, and just throw it all on Cloudflare Workers. It's pretty cool because you can do like HTTP push and all, all these different kinds of things. Just makes your site super fast. Nice. So if you don't have a, a do you have a fun pick? We kind of went back and forth <laughs> battling on this one. Well, I think we're going to talk about the new Max, right? <laughs> we, we have to. So if, if you're watching this on, on YouTube and for some reason it's a little, little catchy, my voice is maybe off, I had to uh, sell my MacBook Pro so I could upgrade, and I don't have my upgrade yet. And so my pick was going to be the Mac Mini with the new M1 processor, and Brian said, ah, I want that. So what do you think? you think it's going to be amazing? Well, I think based on the benchmark scores that we've seen so fast, I mean, uh, seen so far, uh, it's definitely looking to be an amazing first gen kind of thing. And I, I, I found it interesting that they started with the Mac mini 13 uh, inch MacBook Pro and the MacBook Air, uh, just because that is on you know, I don't want to say low end because they're, they're not low end by any means, but in right. terms of Apple, uh, you know, they didn't push out new iMacs, new 16 inch MacBook Pro. Uh, they focused on the more consumer kind of things. And at first I was like, not really impressed, but afterward I was like, that's actually a really smart way to uh, kind of put this out in the world. Because yeah. if you actually look at the benchmarks, uh, someone was testing the single core performance of the MacBook Air, and it's actually faster than the 16 inch MacBook Pro, which is completely absurd. And I, I, I want to see that because everything I keep looking up, they're comparing like, you know, an i5 or whatever, yeah. like not the top yeah. tier. I want, I want to see like the i7 maxed out, you know, 2019 yeah. Pro versus that yeah yeah i think they were testing like the 2020 i9 16 inch macbook pro and the macbook air i believe had a slightly faster single core speed and that's just that's that's completely absurd because first of all the macbook air doesn't have a fan <laughs> yeah. and second of all like i have a 2019 16 inch uh macbook pro and I, that thing gets hot like if i do zoom or something zoom yep. is just that's, that's why like, i sold one i, I had enough engines yeah yeah <laughs> so um, i'm very much looking forward to it uh my wife is going to get a macbook air so i'll be able to hopefully check it out in a few weeks sweet yeah and we're gonna have to stay in touch so you can uh fill me in on that yeah. I, I have been eyeing up the, the cheese grater myself, as they call it. So that's the, the Mac Pro. I think yeah. 2019 was when it was introduced. They might have done the cheese grater before that. but um, So I was toying around with picking that up because of all the video editing and stuff that I end up doing um, for Coding Cat. Um, it, yeah. It's kind of stressful every, like, you know, minute extra I have to wait to, to produce a just a 60 second video or whatever. Yeah. It's infuriating. So I sold my laptop in hopes and I was having those problems. It was getting way too hot. Uh, I was trying to run like Teams and Adobe Premiere and like it just wasn't working. So yeah. the multi-threading and the GPU um, is, is kind of exciting to me and I'm going to test it out for the full 14 days of trial and if it's yeah. if it's good i'm gonna stick with the mac mini but i'm yeah. kind of i'm kind of like uh, if i do this uh, it's gonna hesitate right. me going for the mac pro 2019 so yeah we'll well, i think like as an 
anecdote, like I personally think that now is a really bad time to get in on Intel kind of things. Uh, yeah. And I just speak out of my personal experience where I also sometimes do work in Final Cut Pro and other things like that. And uh, yeah. even on my 16 inch, I'm just editing like 1080p as and I'm also in like ProRes, so it's kind of the optimized format. Yeah. Uh, still, it can be quite slow. And then one time I just tried to like do it on the iPad. So I have <laughs> an iPad Pro. Yeah. And it was incredible. Like no rendering time, nothing. It just like sailed through it. So the fact Same. that they're mo like they move that architecture over to the Max now and you have these like eight core GPUs uh, is pretty cool. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with the Mac Mini. Uh, when you're able to import some stuff into that and start to work on it. Yeah, I'm super pumped. I don't know if Adobe Premiere Pro is going to handle it. I, I might have to switch over to Apple's products because they're going to yeah. you know, be more in line. But I have an iPad Pro as well, and it's unbelievable. So I'm yeah. hoping it's very similar. Um, yeah. I, I hope like all the developer tools and things you know, are, are there day one. They talked a lot about Rosetta, but anyways. Uh, we've diverged from Kinston WordPress uh, hosting too far. So I really appreciate you uh, coming on, Brian. Um, this was awesome. We're gonna ha we're gonna have to have more chats in the future. I think you and I have very similar interests. So thanks yeah. so much for for coming on Perfect That Dev. You're welcome. Yeah, let's do this again in the future. And thanks for having me. For sure. Take care. Yep. Bye.